variables as possible in the model? Great um, question. Great question. So um, I'll give an articulated answer to that um, uh, without treating it exhaustively. Um, so the question was, um, uh, within system science, is it common to try to include as many variables as possible within a model? Um, and one could, uh, at first glance, think this would be very common in as much as in system science, one is, um, one speaks of capturing the generative pathways, the causal pathways operating in the world. Um, one is, as it were, mimicking aspects of the situation in the world in terms of, of different pathways to effect. And one could be excused for thinking that the way to do that is to incorporate um, uh, as many elements uh, as possible to create a model that's as rich as possible. The truth is actually, um, so if I were to give a single word answer, the answer is no. Um, however, it deserves more than a categorical answer. This deserves a little bit of an analytical answer where I, I analyze it in terms of um, uh, the different needs that do present. And this is what's going to lead to the, the more articulated answer that I promised. Um, so within system science, um, uh, one of the key principles that I articulated on that opening lecture on system science modeling was that system science models um, represent simplifications of the world. Mimics of the world, yes, but of necessity um, and, and to their value, they simplify things and, um, and do so uh, to enhance learning. So. The idea here is that I argued that models, like maps, are abstractions and simplifications of the world. And uh, one of the characteristics we speak of in abstraction is that uh, it's a higher level representation of a situation in the world, and it of necessity omits details. And well, the, there's a whole theory about the value of abstraction and why omitting details is an asset, not a liability. But um, the basic gist is that um, uh, we, we need to uh, capture a requisite number of elements or aspects of the world for our model purpose. But typically there's countless, and, and I emphasize countless, aspects of the world that um, are less likely or quite clearly not germane to our model purpose in which are left out. And with maps, I argued uh, from this floor that, um, that uh, the ability to simplify and leave things out is, is most uh, manifestly an asset. So if we have a map uh, in our vehicle and we're trying to ma navigate from the airport to room G3 in the Murray Library in University of Saskatchewan. Um, it's to our advantage that it doesn't show us every tree and blade of grass along the way, every sewer entry location and so on, because those aren't germane to our needs to drive from A to B. But I also argued that if we were biking or walking from the airport, or perhaps more, uh, more recently taking uh, public transit in the form of a bus, we'd need a different map. Right? And the map we use for public transit is a good example. If any of you have, have seen <coughs> subway maps for New York City or, or for Washington, D.C., uh, for Moscow, um, or for Sydney, Australia, um, you'll recognize that, a, for example, a public transit map or a subway map or a map of bus service in Saskatoon or Toronto, um, uh, you know, it, it, it's a gross kind of representation at some level. It grossly simplifies things because the geography is totally distorted. But that's, that's precisely the point. The goal of that map is not to give you a grounded understanding of the geography of the region. The goal is to allow you to reason with clarity about how to get from A to B most efficiently and with, say, fewer stops along the way, right, and fewer transfers. So the goals of a map dictate um, 
what it includes and what it leaves out. And typically it leaves out far more than it includes. <laughs> it you know, leaves out a massive quantity of stuff to, to capture just the bare essentials needed for your purpose. And it's a similar thing, ladies and gentlemen, with, with dynamic model. Um, so with system science models, with dynamic models, typically we, well, we, we should always try to start with some understanding of the set of model purposes to which we aspire. So we, we probably are, have uh, one to three top purposes we have in mind for this model that we're building. So maybe we're seeking to use it to clarify our intuitions as to um, how aspects of early childhood experience might shape later trajectories by examining several hypotheses representing them at a, at a stylized level and seeing how they would affect subsequent trajectories of, of maturation. So maybe there's a you know, critical periods hypothesis, there's a kind of Barkerian early exposures um, uh, lead to kind of um, a, uh, a, a changed internal situation which plays out of a life course, maybe one or two more. And um, within these contexts, uh, that will shape what goes in the model, what doesn't. Alternatively, you might be using a model, for example, to generate data to test a machine learning algorithm that classifies A and B, um, in which case uh, the scope of that model will be delineated by that. Another model might be aimed to examine the trade-off between certain interventions in terms of uh, the healthcare utilization and uh, quality of life and uh, length of life, but does not include cost. And so that will lead you to sort of circumscribe what you put in. Um, uh, this, this topic is dealt with in more detail in my next boot camp, which uh, is in later August, um, following, following my vacation, which starts um, Friday of this week. Um, so, uh, and then, uh, which ends with me standing in front of a group at the next boot camp. Um, and uh, that, so, so there I articulate a set of factors that shape what goes in a model for a particular purpose. And, um, and depending on your purpose, it can include a set of sort of requisite paths that you think are, are very manifestly needed to account for phenomena that you are, that are key for examining outcomes or examining the effects of um, interventions or a key for, um, uh, for, for projecting forward um, with certain outcomes that you're interested in, et cetera. But I had listed um, during my opening presentation a set of different uses of models. And those uses are highly varied. Some of them are, um, are, are familiar, like trade-offs between policies or capacity to anticipate what might be coming in terms of you know, number of cases we have to deal with, number of cases of diabetes that we're going to need to deal with or dialysis needs, right? Um, those are familiar points of reference within modeling space uh, for many people. But then there may be many other needs that um, are less obvious, like uh, models to help prioritize data collection and, and um, help identify which of many points of, of, of unknowns we really need to investigate most uh, most aggressively um, uh, to put efforts into collecting uh, data related to it. Or maybe it's, um, maybe the model is designed, in the system dynamic space, this is particularly common, maybe the model is designed to bring together a bunch of stakeholders who are from very different aspects of the system. Um, uh, being both here from Canada, you know, I can, I can um, perhaps use a Canadian reference that um, Maybe we're dealing with um, issues having to do with mental health and addictions. Let's say the opioid um, crisis. And there, we have people who are working on very different corners of that system. We have police officers and law enforcement. We have corrections personnel who are dealing with opioid-related addictions in corrections facilities, federal penitentiaries, et cetera. We have people from the social services side who are dealing with families torn apart because of addictions. We're dealing with people 
from the side of, of uh, emergency medicine who have to deal with these patients who are exhibiting distressing symptoms which might or might not be uh, addictions related and they've got to triage different patients without knowing often say someone's vomiting um, and feels nauseous whether that's a sign of a withdrawal symptom in which case it will need to be handled differently and maybe with referrals to addictions medicine than if it's a sign of um, gastrointestinal upset due to you know food food poison right so um, uh, you know, there, there might be others from the upstream side, the primary care side, et cetera, and addictions medicine. So the point is that many modeling projects in system dynamics are, the goal of the modeling project, at least early on, is to bring together multiple sets of stakeholders from different parts of the system who often work uh, in ways that are not directly coordinated, only dimly aware of each other's roles, and sometimes suspicious of each other's roles. Think environmentalists, landowners, you know, ranchers when it comes to water scarcity in Western Canada or Western US. Um, you're bringing together you know, the Cattlemen's Association with folks uh, who are, who are you know, um, deep green environmentalists uh, in the same room. And it, it could be expected that that's going to lead to um, you know, interesting nonlinear dynamics um, at, <laughs> at times. But um, the point is there, the modeling, the model is actually designed as a boundary object to bring people together to have discussions in order to, to, to sort of think about consciously each of their place in the system, have their voices heard in an integrative way that brings together those voices under one roof and start to appreciate how what goes on on my side of the world ends up affecting you and vice versa in a way that might, instead of us working at loggerheads with like, I want, I want you to stop doing what you do so I can do what I do undisturbed, or I want money from, that's going to you now to go to me instead. You know, I want money that's going to these emergency room, you know, physicians who are paid uh, high amounts of money to go to my social workers so they can help these families in crisis and prevent them from going to the emergency room. Someone could be excused for having this kind of, um, you know, um, uh, uh, this kind of philosophy where it's a um, limited pie and we've got to divide up the sli slices with greater, greater slice for me because, you know, my side of the world is starving and your side is, is well endowed. But often what you find with these modeling projects is it helps people appreciate how my side of the world depends on your side of the world. And sometimes this leads to me saying, in the end, yes, I'd like to get more resources, but you need more resources too, so I don't get stuck inheriting the consequences. You know? um, and we've used models for exactly that purpose, very powerfully, where, you know, for example, we had higher education, and secondary schools fighting for money, um, the same pot of money. And they ended up going to legislature, it was actually, it was actually in the US and, and Texas. Um, um, I've been around. Uh, and, um, and they argued jointly that the education system as a whole needs more money to build the foundations and higher ed. And uh, that helped them work together more effectively. So they're the model is it important that it includes as many variables as possible? No. You want it to be built such that you could, you could build it at a simple level in a meeting um, and hear different voices and use it to depict a picture that people can recognize about what's going on. It's not a highly technical instrument. It's an instrument to stir up communication, a sense of place within the system, and an appreciation for how my side of the world is indelibly coupled, linked to your side of the world, so that it sets the groundwork for enhanced communication and coordination between the different sides, which might then go on and build a more articulated model. Now, um, so what I'm saying is there's very different model purposes that shape what goes into a model, and model purpose is used to, to quote John Sturman, um, uh, arguably the, the sort of uh, foremost figure uh, for, for the past several years within system dynamics, 
Um, uh, to quote John, um, we use model purpose as a logical knife to cut away unnecessary complexity. Now, I've always, or I've long thought that that quote is a little bit, it, 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 it's good for purpose, it's a little bit glib in when you're trying to teach modeling um, uh, at a deeper level. Because with maps, it's the consequences of leave, leaving things out are often more obvious than in system science. In system science, sometimes we leave something out because we think it's probably not important originally. And then, because models are learning tools in a way that maps are not, okay, uh, maps may not be, um, uh, you know, we run the model, we discover, oh, the model's really sensitive to this area of the system. It's really sensitive to this type of assumption. Often we go back and we re-examine the model scope, the model boundary, what we put in and what we don't. And it's not actually dichotomous. It's what things are exogenous, what things are endogenous, and what things are ignored. I should have rearranged this, but for best pedagogical effect. But um, in other words, what things the model, we're asking the model generate for us, what things we're putting into the model, exogenous, and what things we just leave out from the model, you know, hair color of the patients in our hospital. Unlikely to be of great significance for all model dynamics of interest, whatever they are. Um, so typically models leave out far more than they put in. There are spheres where you know, you're building a highly quantitative model to explicate existing theory in an area which is quite well mapped out to examine quantitative trade-offs between interventions um, where the stakeholders are quite sophisticated, already have a set of tools, and they want something that's a more sophisticated model. And here you will find the modeling community divided. There's a set of, of modelers who says, we absolutely want to include a growing amount of richness in our models by including a growing number of pathways and variables. Um, case in point, microsimulation model. A uh, prominent exponent of this view, Michael Wolfson, who talks about big science of modeling, and you know we need we need models that are equivalent to you know what is it model the the telescopes um, the Keck telescope and the ten meter telescope and the you know James Webb telescope uh, in outer space. We need models that yes, we can, we can have models that are smaller, but we need big science models that are sophisticated, you know, have tons of, of descriptive variables in them and account for the richness of population data. And then there are other modelers of my generation who say, <laughs> I can almost quote them, this is almost a quote, we've been jilted at that, at that altar too many times. We build a model super rich and we find ourselves um, disappointed by, um, by the fact that uh, we, we have expectations out of line what we can reasonably produce given the state of today's science. And it's better to start with really small models that are thinking tools. And I will just mention this. This is gonna sound weird, but I, I wanna get this, uh, this thought out there. And if anyone's interested in more detail, if, and you're really interested in more detail, come to my late August boot camp or you know, listen to the videos, right? Um, there's a set of models that are, that are simple, not in the sense of not being complex. I mean, we build these models because we're dealing with complex systems, systems that are dynamic complex where the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. But they are descriptively simple in the sense that they have few components. An example yesterday that I showed on this very screen was uh, lynxes and hares, right? Predator prey. Descriptively simple. I described it to you quite, quite closely. And if you, in fact, if you looked at the equations, um, they're, they're quite simple to write out. Um, and you could say, well, you know, it doesn't capture the fact that hares are burrowing animals and, you know, change fur color in the winter. And, and that's true but I would argue that it's not so germane for the dynamics that we're seeking to, catch, uh, to capture there. Um, but um, that model is an extremely powerful tool for thinking through the consequences of just a few simple assumptions 
as they yield consequences that are quite, quite sophisticated in terms of the dynamics elicited. And he saw it in over time, and he saw it in state space. And he saw that one variable encodes information about the broader system, which is a common feature in these coupled systems. And um, models within the sphere of dynamic modeling, of system science, some of the most powerful, impactful models historically have been models that are decidedly descriptively simple. So their models, I'll rattle off a few. Um, Schelling's segregation model, a model of segregation. Incredibly powerful. It shows how just a couple assumptions, very simple, so small that I could probably write them on my finger now, um, you know, ends up, well, okay, with a fine pen. pad. Um, uh, but I could, I could describe it very simply. Um, and, and yet it yields patterns that are eerily reminiscent of segregation patterns you see in real world societies of sort of a clumping of people by race or what have you uh, historically. It was created by Thomas Schelling, a Nobel Prize winning uh, economist um, who uh, studied, uh, uh, studied, amongst other things, uh, segregation. And he first played it on a checkers board, actually, it turns out, um, using, using he, did, he simulated the rules manually. Um, uh, and Schelling segregation models is one. Uh, the predator-prey model uh, is, is another one. Um, there's models having to do with, that I don't know, have a unique name, but the carrying capacity of, of, of land. Uh, there's very simple models that have been articulated uh, for supply chain dynamics called the beer game out of MIT um, that's used to test people's reasoning ability not decidedly under alcohol, there's no alcohol involved in the game, but it's um, in decision making involving just a slightly complex system uh, involving supply chain needs. Um, there's a set of other, these super small models that are powerful precisely because they're simple, they yield counterintuitive results that you wouldn't expect from any one piece, and you can think through and ponder them very easily in your head and be surprised by the results. And there's a lot of cases in my modeling career. So, so if you try to place me within the modeling space, um, uh, I tend to spend most of my time with empirically grounded uh, models that aspire to practical informing of understanding and trade-offs uh, in health. Okay? That, that's kind of where I tend to spend my time in the modeling space. But I, uh, I will routinely build a super small model about like just one or two factors in it to sharpen my thinking because I don't know how, you know, I remember one model I built like this um, that's fairly fresh in my mind. We were seeing data, uh, empirical data from the world um, for a situation which um, the evidence seemed to suggest involved rising risk over time, okay? Rising risk over time of a chronic disease. And um, yet when we looked at data, we'd see overall an ambient rising trend, but then we'd see these kind of periods where it went down, and then it, it would go up again, and then it would go down in pronounced ways and go up again. And I was really curious, what, what could be causing it to go down? And, and at some point, pretty early, I, I thought, well, maybe the reason it's going down is because we're looking this through the lens of age-specific incidence rates. And maybe, maybe a lot of that's a reflection of the fact that when you have age-specific rates, if you have a cohort of people coming in um, uh, that's larger, uh, maybe that will lead to a cohort going out that's larger and, um, or that's at higher risk, um, I'm not, I'm kind of butchering this, and, and that will lead to, um, uh, to, to lowering of rates. And so basically I built a super small model which had rising rates in it. I, I told it, you know, make the hazard rate rise over time for this chronic disease. But I accumulated statistics in the model on age specific rates. And I looked at the outputs from this model and I saw that age specific rates would go up for a while and then they kind of go down and then they go up and go down, just like I saw in the world. 
or you know another time I think or maybe it was maybe it was the, the same model can't remember um, I was looking at variability stochastically that we see on incidence rates and I thought you know could what degree could this variability be just the result of individual level variability there's an overall hazard rate but because sometimes it's more people sometimes it's fewer it's a comparatively small number maybe it would account for this and I examined it and yes it, it does I built these small models to test my to sharpen my thinking to challenge my thinking to to um, you know to, to help me reason through how different factors behave and this gives to a degree it gives lie to my comments that a model my analogy a model is kind of a working hypothesis in the world for what's going on out there often it is but there are many times I build a model that decidedly leaves out a lot of factors I know are really important in the world so I can focus on one or you know two or three to see how they interact if, if I only include those and I examine the consequences of their interactions, what results? And that helps me interpret results for a more sophisticated model or for the world. You know, to what degree could that oscillatory pattern just be explained by this? Maybe it's just these two things interacting and a model can help me think that through. And often I find myself surprised. You know, it was a cherished idea. Yeah, I thought those two interacting could yield that pattern doesn't or in other cases it does and I say wow that pattern is robust then if I add a third factor in it's still robust maybe that's a lot what's behind these patterns I see in the world or it helps me explain for a for a more sophisticated model so Wade will understand and, and other students here you'll recognize that for the students who are working often with more sophisticated models I say okay make a copy of the model and now disable this 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 and this and this and now run it and let's see, do we still see that pattern? Um, I try to chase down, as we say, the fox's tail. Try to see where, where that fox's layer is. Like why, what two factors interacting give rise to this, or three factors? And we, we chase it down by disabling things. Not because disabling makes the world a better, makes the model a better descriptor of the world. It doesn't. It, it helps us sharpen our thinking, which then lets us go back to the world with renewed clarity about what really needs to be in our model. What's essential for accounting for the features we're trying to explain? And indeed, that's a big use of models. I see this weird feature historically. What could be causing it? Sometimes simple models are a just great way of answering that. Now, I will go beyond this and say that, that the issue of adding things into models needs to be approached with great caution, okay? And it needs to be approached by enormous, by extra caution in certain modeling sub-areas sub or modeling types. With agent-based modeling, it's particularly liberating in terms of flexibility. And you can, you have more than enough rope, forgive the analogy, but to hang yourself with. You have more than enough you have more than enough flexibility to just layer things in with limited additional gain to your insight and understanding. And in fact, often more things end up obscuring your thinking. So they end up having net negative value. Now, if your goal is simply prediction, to predict you know, how the system will behave, you, you, you might think adding things in could help that, um, but uh, there are often limits as to what you can real how you can realistically divide your time between adding things, and almost inevitably there's an opportunity cost. You add A in, you can't spend time um, refining your thinking about B that's already in there. So even there, you tend to be very cautious about adding things in additionally, and uh, often. Um, often we, we say, add it in when you're convinced that it's, it needs to be added. Now, there's certain sub-areas of modeling, or sub-techniques, that are more resistant to this. So in system dynamics modeling, modeling variously called compartmental models, uh, aggregate models, ODE models, state space models, goes by different names in different, different sub-disciplines of, of applied math and 
and you know different uh, fields of mathematical epidemiology, etc. Um, these sort of models they tend to to be simpler by design. Partly that's because system dynamics of these particularly emphasizes models that are easily understood by stakeholders. So I can show you the model and you can critique it. Remember I argued from this very floor, not two days thence, that um, models are tools for learning. And one of the biggest ways we learn is to welcome critique by others. We take these ideas about what might be going on in the world. We put it into an explicit fashion, a fashion that can be shown to others, that's publicly accessible, that can be you know, drawn out, sketched, and I can show it to another person and they can critique it. That is a advance because it makes these inchoate ideas in our head concrete and because they're taken out in a way that can be critiqued by others and collectively refined. This is one big use of a model. And in system dynamics, that tends to lead to models that are super simple. So there's a lot of group model building in system dynamics that goes on with two stock models, for example. Or, OK, if you're really pushing the edge sometimes in a group model building session, you might have three stocks, you know, three state variables. Um, and, and a lot of system dynamics models, because, partly because of the desire to communicate with clarity to stakeholders, get that feedback, and critically change how they think about the world, they, they aspire to fewer compartments that are easier for someone to grasp why we're seeing some weird counterintuitive effect, because it boils it down to its essence. And system dynamics, as in terms of creating aggregate models, and it's also used in rich ways at an individual level, in hybrid models, but for aggregate models, system dynamics ends up um, uh, also having limitations on what you can easily describe compared to agent-based modeling. You, you tend to get kind of boxed in a little bit by the approach in term, terms of what you can characterize because stocks are memoryless. Um, you can have an outflow that changes over time. There's no problem with that, unlike in hidden Markov models. But you, you well, OK. I mean, there's, there's other uses of system dynamics with things called conveyors and so on and ovens, and, and the, which, which are not sort of original system dynamics, but where your chance of leaving can actually vary for how long you've been there. But traditional system dynamics, you don't, it, it, doesn't, it, it doesn't reflect how long you've been there. It's independent. For anyone who's in that stock, they have the same chance per unit time of leaving as anyone else. And, that, and that's one example of many in system dynamics, which kind of box you in a little bit. So I've had students, uh, one memorable student, Kurt Kruger, who's an awesome modeler and is about to set foot in the province in another two days um, to the province's benefit. Um, he, he talks about, he had a modeling project for our Ministry of Health, which um, was the start of the Project UN um, completed to great success um, for ED weights and patient flow. And he had a very simple system dynamics model of it. But he, he then switched at some point to agent-based modeling. He said, you know, should I stick with system dynamics for this, or am I at the point where I should go to agent-based modeling? I said, Kurt, look, you're, you're, you're capable in both, both uh, languages. Um, try try agent-based modeling for a week. See what it feels like compared to the system dynamics in terms of articulating what you need, what you believe need, you need to put into the model based on stakeholder feedback. And then judge at the end of that week, do I want to stick with system dynamics or do I want to switch as my main mode of expression for this project to agent-based modeling or as the second mode of expression. So he did that for a week. And he told me the next Friday, he looked, Kurt is someone who carries even yet the blush of youth. And um, he, he looked liberated. He said, he said, Nate, I feel like I was walking through a maze of tight corridors before, getting blocked going this way, that going that way. And now he said, now it feels like I'm running through a Saskatchewan field with, with no fence in sight, and I can go wherever I want. And that's, it's true that agent-based modeling can be liberating in terms of what you can represent. But that's the danger, too. Because you can just layer things in willy-nilly 
and not get a lot more clarity out of it. And then you're dealing with a model that's hard to understand, hard to reason about, and it is uh, expensive to run, its performance is poor, and hard for a stakeholder to, to understand and give feedback on. If you see interesting dynamics, you don't know where it's from, and you end up kind of bogging down um, under the sheer weight of all of the different uh, factors that are represented. So I have a student, I have a close colleague from North Carolina who talks about her doctoral experience where she was working with agent-based modelers for characterizing um, a interaction of TB and smoking. And she built up a very rich agent-based model. And she would run it and she would receive results, but she would say, you know, are these results, what are they coming from? Like, why do I see this? And it would take a very long time to try to disable things, to turn that off. Sometimes she feared that it's a result of a weird bug, because they were working in an earlier package, which has, a, has some awkwardness, and easily bugs can creep in um, to that. And she just felt this, and it would take a long time to run, and it was just slowing the learning. So she ended up creating you know, a three-stock system dynamics model from it and got a tremendous amount of insight. And that became her doctoral dissertation, which did not include at all the agent-based component, which is interesting. Um, I do a great deal of system dynamics modeling. I do a great deal of agent-based modeling. And I'll tell you, it's a tribalist world out there. And the system dynamics folks, they say, oh, Nate, he does mostly agent-based modeling. The agent-based folks say, yeah, Nate, he's a system dynamics modeler. Um, and each one kind of resents the other. Um, <laughs> So I'm, I'm happily an, an infidel in both camps, I suppose. Um, but that's never stopped me. So um, the, 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 the point is, I overstate that. It, 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 the, both sides just have a little bit of suspicion of me. Like, he's, he, he consorts with the models of the opposite sort. You know? um, anyway, um, there, what I'm saying is more detail obscures. More detail obscures our ability to communicate with stakeholders often. It obscures our ability to reason through the model. It obscures our ability to run the model quickly and learn from it quickly. And as it turns out, when it comes to data science, um, uh, it's going to also um, you know, make it uh, more challenging to uh, effectively uh, estimate the latent state of the whole system. So generally speaking, we use great caution in adding in a new feature. Um, there's many reasons for doing so, but we, we exercise caution, um, judicial, and um, deliberation to figure out should we, should we put this in. And uh, we critically use the purpose of the model to say, do we really need it? There's a lot of times you just park it in a parking lot and say, we'll come back to that. We'll conduct some sensitivity analyses and figure out, would this vary the model? We'll examine how much our current set of factors account for the patterns we see that we're seeking to explain. Um, or we'll run it by our stakeholders and figure out to what degree it's required for their buy-in to have this additional factor. Um, those are just a few of a bunch that I will, I will um, talk about within the August bootcamp. Um, but yeah, we exercise great caution, and we by no means do we always put in more factors. Generally, if, if you put in tons and tons of factors a model, it's, it's headed in a not good way as a project. Yes, sure you yeah, um, yeah, Regarding the uh, mixture of uh, different levels of aggregation mm. in a system that ends model, mm. uh, yeah, this is just maybe as a hypothesized uh, sample. For example, you consider the supply and the demand of the global buy energy, right? Yes. And also you consider the individual level of right. uh, energy metabolism. Mm. Uh, because right. how, how can you put those kind of things in, in, a, in a single model, right? Because it's a different level. Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. Yeah. Um, uh, and um, so, so this question has particular currency because we have entered an age where it is practical, it is feasible computationally, and it is doable in some spheres to build multi-scale models that capture you know, individual decision making, say about 
if we were to think about energy use as far as like energy conservation, you know, demand, you know, use of, of energy at an individual level or use of water, to go back to that example for, you know, water, water scarcity um, on the one hand and also have the supply side, you know, the, the water management infrastructures, dams, um, uh, you know, uh, water provision and treatment plants or energy generation, et cetera. Um, and the, our group, our group here, has made a handful, and an important handful, it's a handful I'm, I'm perhaps most proud about of all the models we've made, of models that, that span these different levels, okay? So they span physiologic up to public health level. And Chin Yang right there um, with the fedora on um, is, is particularly notable for, um, for having a beautiful model, say, of diabetes which characterizes things at a, at a, a level of the metabolic, the level of the physiology, I shouldn't say metabolic pathways, but physiology in a way that also has representation of, of individual clinical progression, multi-generational effects, the mother and baby, multiple generations, uh, cl uh, clinical um, uh, pathways for that mother, uh, health service delivery and public health. And that's a very successful model. But what I'd say is, that you really, it requires a great deal of fortitude, savviness, um, a, a broad consultative team, and a lot of computational power to go down this route. And it is not to be done for most projects. Here I am, you know, I've been doing agent-based modeling since, for coming up now on 30 years. Since 1990, I, I built my first agent-based models. Um, I won't ask my students what they were doing <laughs> that year. Um, but I built my first agent-based models then. I built my first system dynamics models a couple of years later. And, and I've only built a couple of successful models. I've only built a couple of models um, uh, 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 that are multi-scale in character. Um, I could you know, rattle them off. Um, one other is in immune dynamics and, and uh, chlamydia. And, immune dynamics at a more theoretical level and, and uh, immunoepidemiology work. I would say we have to be very cautious of this and um, I tend to be a proponent of not just hybrid models, which these are examples of, but of models that are used in clusters. So for a given modeling project, like let's say the ED weights and patient flow project, we actually had multiple models we built in that project. It wasn't just we had one model. We had Kurt's stock and flow model of the uh, of patient flow, but we had an agent-based and a discrete event model. And, um, and these gave us different lenses to understand the situation. So often I would build a model at the lower level to understand the salient patterns of individual <coughs> needs and see if we could learn from that to create a more aggregate model. One of the most clear-sighted people that I know in this space, um, uh, and as well as many others, is the person who coined this term learning prostheses for models, and it's Jeff McDonald of Sydney, Australia, who I know several of you know, um, uh, and with, with some of you, you've been lucky to spend time um, with uh, the sage of Sydney. Um, and um, Jeff, uh, Jeff talks about rather than confining ourselves to models that are descriptively simple from the start and only building those models for stakeholders, he talks about going through a process where you first start with the simple models. It's kind of a V process. You start with super simple models. And you use those models to stir up and sharpen our thinking. And then you go on to, to richer models that capture in a savvy way that thinking in a richer way that adds additional, adds additional salient details which seem to be required for, a, for, for, for um, reliable reasoning and, and accounting for the goals of the model and for communicating with stakeholders. And then at some point you've learned enough from those sophisticated models that you go back and you start to simplify and cut it down to its essence. And so at the end, you have a simple model that's very different from the simple model you started with. 
because it's been honed by learning along the way. It's been shaped by what's the minimum sort of uh, the minimum story we need to account for here. And sometimes the variables are quite different, the characterization. And so what I'd say, Dr. New, is, is you know, starting with, with a model of different areas of the system, seeing if at the lower level you might be able to come up with some sort of higher level characterization that would, um, it might still be at an agent base level, but it doesn't require you know, simulation of metabolic uh, elements or physiologic elements, but it's good enough for the purposes of, of simulating the, uh, the broader system. Um, sometimes this is possible. And here we're taking advantage of kind of a collection of models to learn about different scales of behavior. And uh, we might try as an exploratory model something that cuts across scales, just you know, see, see if it yields uh, such findings that we have to, we have to commit to that path. But um, if you are going to go down that path of a multi-scale model, you will have much more evidence about why it's needed for grant applications or going to sponsors and saying, look, we're going to need more, you know, a more fulsome um, investment in this to, to take it to its requisite level. This is what we may be missing by not having those features. So I would say use different models to understand the needs and then you can make that case. There's some wonderful work in this area that is multi-scale based or where people have started with multiple models and try to combine them. Um, I'm a big um, fan of Patricia Fabian's work at BU on airborne, on airborne contaminants and effects on health. And she does a bit of multi-scale modeling there. But it's not, it's not to be entered in glibly and it's not to just say we got to do it um, because um, it, it needs to have enough evidence. The opportunity cost is high enough. It'll be a, a long enough process and a slow enough process to build a multi-scale model that you owe it to yourselves and funders and others to make a, uh, a very deliberative decision about whether it's needed. I hope those are helpful comments. So, um, so to, answer, to go back to your question, the answer was no about do we add in extra models? And you will find some, a, some modelers within the system science space who say, you know, do not, do not, do not add any more variables than you need for clarity of insight as to how these factors fit together. Um, I'm a little bit, I've been around the bush a bunch of times since 1990. Um, I wear an older man's shoes now. Um, and what I will say is, in my view, um, it's not, I don't always adhere to, you know, three variable models or, or six variable models. I do make use of richer model because sometimes I think it's absolutely essential for the purpose for which the model is aimed. But um, do so with great caution, deliberation, and evidence like with sensitivity analysis or evidence from stakeholders that we really need to account for this theory that says we really need to put this in to have even a, a face plausibility in capturing the dynamics of interest. But, um, you know, there's different schools of thought and mine is not particularly privileged. Um, I'm, uh, I'm just one, one modeler of, of, of many uh, out there and you'll find very strong feelings about this issue from other modelers and between different communities like this micro simulation community and traditional agent based modelers even though they have approaches that are at some level mathematically comparable, they tend to have very different views on this issue. Triggerscape is another really simple model that, that uh, turned waves. The model of the Anasazi is another one that's nice. It appeared in the pages of PNAS. Anyway, those are some comments. Any other questions? <coughs> Tara? Just a final comment on that sort of broad topic that you, I'm not sure if you specifically mentioned or not, but sometimes um, we get pushed to put things into models just to satisfy stakeholder trust in the models. Yes, yes. I mean, it's, it's right. it not necessarily that Absolutely. it contributes a lot to model understanding totally. or to, you know, anything else, but if we don't account for this particular factor, and it's yes. no different in statistical modeling, That's right. sometimes you have, you just have to adjust for X or you have to include uh, Y. 
Couldn't agree more. Couldn't agree more. And in the practical day-to-day -day reality of sponsored modeling projects, um, uh, you know, this this is a significant yeah. consideration. This is what I alluded to uh, in in imprecise terms by face plausibility. Yeah. Look. We need our stakeholders to buy into our model. Without stakeholder buy-in and um, you know, stakeholder trust, we're not going to be able to achieve the goals of the modeling project. We won't get that feedback. We won't get that ongoing support. We won't get that um, consultative ability. And so we need that feedback. And so sometimes we end up putting things in that are th that maybe our first impulses wouldn't say are likely to be the priority. But it's important. Jeff McDonald is again. Um, uh, Jeff McDonald has a few years on me, um, uh, and um, and he's been around the bush a bunch of times too, and he's been around some big bushes. Um, and he he comments that um, that he's a physician in addition to being an engineer by training, and he comments that um, physicians almost always. Or very commonly, physicians conceptualize things at an individual level because so much of their training is about engaging with particular patients. And so they tend to be drawn to representations where there are individuals and individual stories in it. And he said, you can try to bring physicians along with system dynamics models that are aggregate in character, but it requires a lot more effort. And sometimes they just won't go there. They, they just do not want to deal with that. They find it so abstract as to be, if not dehumanizing, they find it so abstract as to be just boggling their mind. Meanwhile, I work with demographers who feel put out by agent-based models sometimes, and they, can, they, they parse and appreciate aggregate models because they're dealing with population categories and the count of people in population categories. And, and they're very familiar with compartmental, and they feel more akin to it, or more, more, um, more comfortable with it. Jeff McDonald talks about how different stakeholders you will sometimes need to shape your modeling approach to secure their buy-in, because that will allow you to get the feedback you need to sharpen your model. And so sometimes you put in these things. You know, Jeff, Jeff has said, and at first I, okay, Jeff said two things over the course of his career that I'll tell you. I have, uh, there, there are two things I'll, I'll, I'll give you now where I've had some ambivalence towards them, but I think there's a lot of wisdom there. Um, one thing is, he says, if you want to get stakeholders bought into your model who know nothing about modeling and are impatient with abstractions, it's a total on start to go in and say, I have a mathematical model of your situation. <laughs> you know, we're police officers, you know, <laughs> we're on our beat, you know. Um, we don't have time for fancy math. Um, you bring into them a GIS picture that shows agents moving around Saskatoon, and you know shows the downtown core and and things they can recognize. And often they will say, "Oh, okay." It actually expands their mind as to what's possible that you can follow agents over time who have certain characteristics here, geographic position and you can incorporate various features of the context in terms of how they move, like roads and where the roads go, and, and you can characterize their interaction. It like brings it home to them in an odd way. I don't know what it is about GIS, but it just tends to have that effect for many people who are otherwise resistant to thinking about these sort of models. It kind of cuts through the, 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 the clutter um, in terms of their appreciation of abstraction. And so, you know, don't show them state charts. Show them pictures of people moving around in an environment that they recognize. They say, that's my beat. You know, that's, that's my neighborhood. There, there I is. And, um, oh, could you just add this other, you know, convenience store where the kids hang around? Um, or something like that. And, and it gets them, you know, gets them involved in the discussion, which then sometimes opens up. It's not a magic bullet, but it, it helps advance their openness. The other thing Jeff said early on, which struck me, I didn't like it at first, and for a couple of years I really didn't buy into it, but now I buy into it. Um, and uh, he said, look, modeling is storytelling. All our mod, that the most powerful thing that you can bring to a decision maker, policy maker, um, 
policy t analyst team or, or others is often stories. It's narratives. It's, it's powerful stories that tell a lesson. And, you know, if you listen to indigenous cultures and you listen to, um, uh, to many on the anthropology front, they'll tell you that storytelling has a special role in societies of all different sorts. People like stories. And, and Jeff has long emphasized, use your model to tell a compelling story. And, and it's often the story that they'll remember, that's the parable, it's the lesson learned from that story. And these models can be stories, and agent-based models, like Jan has spent a fair degree of time building up stories about women's trajectories, you know, who are involved in interventions concerning di gestational diabetes and how they would have ended up without the intervention or did end up with it or, or you know, societal investment, how that changed the situation in terms of level of cases of gestational diabetes, but what lies below that in terms of uh, level of dysglycemia or, or level of, um, uh, of, of people's, um, uh, people's level of, of um, use requirement for, um, for medications or for gestational diabetes. She's done a lot of storytelling with her model for policy presentations over in the Australia Capital Territory. And it's very powerful. Models at an aggregate level can tell aggregate stories. Models at an individual level can tell individual and aggregate stories um, of stories of particular people, stories uh, of the society as a whole. And you can use that for very powerful storytelling. Pursuant to the goals of this boot camp, tools like this tell stories. What we pick up with Africa tell stories. Those pictures I showed you of you know the, the exposure of a surfer to different levels of adverse water quality, development of HCGI, or the stories that come up with service dogs, so well worked on uh, here by Jenna, um, with service dogs and veterans with PTSD and their their, their accompaniment with the dog. There's a narrative there that's rich, and we can compare that narrative with what we get out of the model, but this is, it taps into something about storytelling that's very powerful. And so Jeff, long ago, when I'm, 10 years ago or longer, um, Jeff, you know, um, conveyed to me the critical role that he believes storytelling plays in modeling. In, in, in getting buy-in or getting getting learning on the part of stakeholders, and I believe it's true, and we can use that power for good. Um, it can also be misused. Um, there are stories that foster charge prejudices. There are stories that lead to division. But there's ways in which we and there are stories that can be untrue, and and you know you know uh, foster misunderstanding or. Um, or uh, misunderst misunderstanding or, or um, misleading choices. But there's many stories that emerge from the model that are powerful because you, in a story you can cut to the essence of basically what's going on here. And that can be powerful for shifting how a decision maker thinks about the situation. So storytelling, modeling as storytelling. Gosh, I could almost have a class on that. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe I could get it registered in anthropology or something. Um, <laughs> whether someone would sign up, I don't know. Um, OK, um, other question. You notice I wove into that account some storytelling. Um, <laughs> Jeff McDonald has my hat off. Um, um, we've been lucky 